So Matt, after 558 appearances, the curtain finally comes down on a glittering career, all but one of those appearances for Wickham Wanderers Football Club. Can you firstly start by talking us through your reasons behind the decision to retire now? Yeah, so the decision the decision to retire on medical grounds was made um, um, because I visited a lot of medical experts to try and figure out the you know that I've suffered a couple of concussions in the past and and always recovered um, within days and and we, you know the first week I'm feeling feeling fine and wanting to play again but this one hung around a lot longer the repercussions were were a lot longer um, so it was an innocuous incident at Exeter the ball hit me on the back of the head. Um, knocking me to the ground but immediately I was dizzy um, I knew where I was but I was dizzy and getting off the pitch was an issue I was trying to walk straight and I kept veering off towards the away fans on the right and the doctor said when I was walking down the tunnel I was hitting both sides of the walls I was, I was struggling to to walk straight so I, I knew um, I knew I was a bit dizzy and stuff and but then in the days and weeks that followed um, I was struggling to see light and things that usually gave me great delight like sitting with my girls reading their books um, my fatigue levels were high, my energy levels were really low. I, after a week or two, I tried to get out on my bike and couldn't. Um, I literally had to turn around as soon as I got to the end of my road. I was, you know, ev everything was kind of a lot harder, and, and the headaches and uh, fatigue levels that followed. I knew that it was different. So um, the doctor took me to see some some different people. We got we got as much advice as we could, and unfortunately, um, the only course of action was to retire. So um, it's taken a little while to come to that conclusion. Um, but I know it's the right conclusion because I have to put my my brain health first and uh, and the repercussions of that incident have been um, long lasting and, and I'm still kind of living with a few bits today. So um, unfortunately, that's that's the way it came to an end. And is that how has that been difficult for yourself to process in the time that it's from being told that you're probably going to have to part with it to the time when you actually announced it this week? Yeah, I, I guess it's been harder because you know in an ideal world you go out on your own terms. You can. You can choose your last game and you get to say goodbye to people who've made um, a big influence and difference in your career and, 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 and everything's lovely. But to go to go out due to a head, you know, a head concussion in an EFL Cup match away at Exeter, miles from home with only 150 um, Wickham fans there is obviously not the ideal scenario. But, you know, uh, that happens in life. Life's not fair. I've, my mum taught me that when I was a child. So you have to just kind of get on with it. And I've been extremely fortunate to to live a life in football and, and live my dream for, you know, it's 21 years since I left school and become a professional footballer. So I'm certainly not going to grizzle about a way it's ended. It's obviously made that process slightly harder, but um, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. So it's just a way of um, taking that on the chin and, and, and trying to move on into the next career, which I'm looking forward to doing now. And of course, you've been inundated with messages from past teammates, Wickham supporters and Ipswich supporters as well. That must make you feel really proud and feel like you have really achieved what you've achieved in your career. Yeah, it's, it, it makes me feel really, really proud, mate. I never dreamt or never envisaged that I'd be so um, inundated with messages. I'm, I'm, I'm so touched, you know, ex-teammates, current teammates, supporters of our club from Ipswich and, and other teams around the country have, have, have messaged me as well. It's been so so incredible and I, and I feel so lucky and the thing that I've learned through life in football and, and it's getting a little bit deep but it's about those relationships you build with people it's about spending life with good people and, and the relationships and the memories you make along the way and so you know to spend your whole career at one club really allows you to make deep life lasting bonds with people um, and so you know, I, it, it kind of went by in a blur in many ways the 18 years because there was always something to strive for and achieve but now I'm so proud to have done it in, in one place because um, it makes you realise that you've been really able to impact people's lives and, and made them feel feel great. And, and, and in turn, that's made me feel really good. So it's it's been an emotional few days, but um, it's certainly given me a real life lesson about, um, you know, it's the relationships you build with people and how you make people feel and how they make you feel, which which is what's really important. 18 years then, let's go right back to the start. Ipswich versus Knox County, a League Cup game. Um, talk us through your emotions of that day, if you can remember it, and sort of the feeling of all that hard work and making your debut for your boyhood club, it's which town? Yeah, it's actually quite, I came on in, in the first half, um, maybe after half an hour or something like that. It was, it was in the first half, I remember. Um, and it was just a boyhood dream come true. I was an Ipswich supporter as a, as, a, as a kid. I was born in Ipswich, lived 15 minutes away in Phoenix. So my granddad used to take me to games when I was in the academy. We used to get free tickets, so I'd go every week and watch. So to actually make my debut for the first team was 
was incredible. Um, you know, after getting beat away at Notts County, I think we were in the championship. They might have been League Two at the time, so we got beat in a League Cup game. And I just come off the pitch with a real dejected feeling. I I didn't even keep my shirt. I threw it in the in the wash because I was just so devastated and disappointed that result went against us and I knew that that was going to count against me it's my debut and I wanted to make an imprint in in the manager's mind and I knew that getting beat in a in a game like that was going to count against me and I was so disappointed and as it played out I was told not long after that my future wasn't at the club and that I could move on so um, no one can ever take that one appearance away from me because it was from my boyhood club and, and I'll always cherish that um, so that was it was an even a disappointment, if I'm honest, because I wanted to go and create a life and a career for myself playing for Ipswich. But little did I realise that um, the blessing that that I was about to be given by signing for Wickham Wanderers and being re released by Ipswich was going to change my life. It, it made me stand on my own two feet. I had to move away from home and become a man rather than a boy surrounded by family and friends. I had to, you know, really go and create a life and a career for myself. And at that point, I could have, I could have, you know, shelved it all and done something else because it was tough walking into a change room full of adults who who uh, were having a difficult time bottom of league one or uh, division two as it was at that point um you know it, it, there was many times when I could have knocked it on the head because it was tough but there was a desperation inside of me to create a career for myself and like I say it's only on reflection I realized it was the biggest blessing I ever had because I got to go and create a life and a, and a career at a club that is truly unique truly special and um, like I say, it's really impacted my life. I spent my whole adult life playing for Wickham Wanderers and it's and it's been an incredible journey. So little did you know that your next move after it would be your last. But um, yeah, talk us through um, how the move came about, your thoughts about the club back then when you first walked through the door. Yeah, so the move came about, I was actually, it was just before Christmas um, and the Ipswich youth team always used to go out for a Christmas night out, a meal. Um, and I was a year above the youth team, but I was going to meet a few of the boys and um, to have some food. Um, I went in the shower, got out and had an answer phone message from Tony Adams, which doesn't happen every day. And, and Arsenal, an England legend, leaving you an, a, a message. And he left me a, a voicemail just saying, hi, Matt, Tony here. Um, I've watched you play for Ipswich Reserves. We'd like to sign you at Wickham Wanderers. Um, please, can you give me a call back? I'd like to discuss this with you. So I rang him back and said, great, um, I'll be there tomorrow. And he couldn't believe believe my enthusiasm for it so I literally packed a bag went and stayed luckily my uncle lived 20 minutes away in Thames so I went and stayed with him that night came to training the next day um, loved it um, watched the team on the Saturday they actually beat Bournemouth I believe and I thought well we can get out of this relegation zone I'm going to sign signed on the Monday job done um, we got relegated that year and it was actually a real real tough six months for me physically and mentally trying to adjust to men's football and mentally being away, being in a change room where I didn't know anyone and trying to make some friends. Um, yeah, it was a really, really tough six months for me, but luckily I saw it through um, and managed to start making strides in the team the next season and, uh, and moving my career forward. So that's how it came about. You had some real success in the league in your 18 years at Wickham, but we'll get to that a bit later. Talk about success in the cup, that cup run in uh, 2007 um, and this, all the way to the semi-final against Jose Mourinho's Chelsea. Talk us through that experience, the whole cup run and then obviously coming against Jose's boys. Yeah, it was incredible. I, I, I was trying to explain to the boys this morning, in 18 years, you only have a few successful ones. You know, I had four promotions, a couple of cup runs and you really realise the bonds that you make with people during the successful time are so much deeper and stronger than, than the not so, so successful ones. There must be some kind of psychology behind that. But that group of lads we had at that point, you know, um, Moons and Jermaine Easter up front, what a pairing they were. Um, and then, you know, Russell Martin, Mike Williamson, myself, Sergio Torres, as, as the young lads who were really trying to make an imprint in the professional game. Then you had season pros like, um, Stefan Oakes, um, Tommy Doherty, what a player Tommy Doc was, what a mm. gifted footballer. Kevin Betsy out on the right hand side, who used to just drive us up the pitch by dribbling and, and carrying the team up the pitch. Um, Danny Sender, you know, Roger Johnson, we had such a good team. Um, we had a couple of young lads on loan, Anthony Grant and um, Scotty Goldborn from, from Chelsea and Reading. So it was a great group of lads. We used you know, we went to Fulham and won, they were in the Premier League. We went to Charlton away and won, they were in the Premier League. Um, so it was, wasn't as even as, as if we had an easy route. The hardest game we had, I think, was probably the, the quarterfinals away at Notts County. Notts County, again, coming into, into my cup career um, because they're in the same league as us and suddenly there was an expectation to get through to the semi-finals. So, you know, that group, what, what uh, a group of players 
Um, some of them went on, you know, Russell and Mike went on, on to have incredible careers um, playing in the Premier League. So um, Paul Lambert was probably in the infancy of his manager, managerial career. And alongside him, Ian Culverhouse was uh, a really, really good football coach and did some great sessions on the grass. So those were friends I made for life, some of those boys, and we're still in really regular contact um, now. So, yeah, what a year. And I, I look, on, look back on that year with real fond memories. It's just a shame we didn't transfer that to the league because that talented group and squad should have should have got promoted one of those two seasons that, that Paul was here. We just um, probably overdid the cup a little bit and our exploits. Um, we then used to lose some silly games on the Saturday because maybe we were all a little bit emotionally drained from, from the Tuesday night. You've achieved a lot in your career. One of the a personal accolades you can celebrate is right up until the championship season last season, you scored in every season that you played in a Wickham Wanderers shirt. That must feel good. Um, is there one particular goal that stands out for you? Um, so there was a left-footed one that Cess dug out the other day, Matt Cess at, at Wickham, away at Rushton. I didn't score many with my left and not many from outside the box either. So that was that was one. Um, another one is probably the goal in the championship at Derby. It was from about a centimetre and it was more of a tackle than a shot. Um, but just I think the fact that it taken me so long, so much heartache and work and desire to get to the championship and I, I never thought I'd get there. So to actually get my name on the score sheet in a championship match and a team managed by a, an England legend in Wayne Rooney was just, just bizarre. So I just think to get to that level and actually um, achieve and get my set name on the score sheet, that was um, a real special moment, but for all of the backstory and, and what it took to actually get there more than the actual, actual goal itself. That first promotion medal that you got, got was around your neck in 2009. Just talk us through your emotions there when earning that first promotion. Yeah, that was that was really really good under under Peter Taylor. I think it, I got to that point in my career where I'd just come back from a, a cruciate ligament injury, so I was kind of in and out of the team, not a mainstay. That's for, that's that's for certain, but in and out a little bit. Um, so managed to get a promotion and really got the taste of what it felt to achieve some success on the pitch um, over a promotion season. You know, a cup runs great, but it's maybe over five or six games. A pro promotion season takes um, graft day in day out. Um, game in, game out over a long period of time, 10 months over a pre-season and game. So that was great. Um, a real good group of lads, hard working. That was a um, that that was a team that knew how to win. We it felt like we looked, won a lot of games 1-0. Peter set us out, really organised, a real, real good manager who knew how to win games, a real good man, um, someone who got the lads really working for him. Um, and we had a real good group. So that was the first time I'd really kind of tasted that success. And had, we had people like Gary Holt in the year, in the team that season, you know, someone who'd been in the game a long time and knew knew how to grind out results. Of course, your next promotion was with then teammate Gareth Ainsworth. Um, could you see the qualities in him then that have gone on to see him be the successful manager he is today? Yeah, he was such an inspirational figure for us that year. He's our top scorer, I believe, from the right of midfield. He was the captain, top scorer. He was the figurehead of the team, if you know what I mean. He was he was the guy that we all looked for when we needed some inspiration. He'd either, you know, shoot from 25, 30 yards or he'd run down the wing and cross it. Or he'd, I remember Cheltenham away, we won on New Year's Day, I think, that year. And he scored a header, header from maybe even outside the box. It was incredible. So, um, yeah, that was a real good group of people. Again, Scott Rendell and, and Strevs up front, me and Stu Lewis in midfield. Loads of energy, loads of enthusiasm. Uh, and, and Gaz was out on the right, as he, Gaz as he, touched, as he was at the time before he became Gaffer, out on the right as our real figurehead. So, again, a really enjoyable season, a good group of people. And, and under Gary Waddock and Martin Cool, really good football people who, um, brilliant sessions out on the grass. And we played some really good football that year and a really enjoyable season. You say Gaz to Gaffer. How was that an adjustment from Gaz, the teammate, to uh, Gareth to Gaffer? Well, for the first few months, it was tough for me because I kept calling him Gaz and completely um, had to realign my habits that he was now Gaffer. So um, that was that was quite a tough adjustment in terms of what just um, just to call him Gaffer. But my respect for him and his respect for me was reciprocal. Um, and I, th I think if you have that high level of respect and you start start at that point, then everything else can just can just flow, if you know what I mean. So. He became Gaffer and, and really cut his teeth in management. And I saw him flourish as, as a manager from those tough cut first couple of seasons where we nearly dropped out the, the basement of League Two to the next year when we got to the playoff final at Wembley. And really, that was when we saw him um, reconfigure the changing room, reconfigure um, how he wanted to go about things and really put his stamp on the football club. And he's, he's dragged this club forward ever since. Him and Dobbo have been 
incredible servants, the best managerial duo this club have ever had, um, the best manager that the club's ever had, and and really dragged this this place forward from a place of um, under the trust, really struggling to survive as a football club financially to get into the championship for the first time in its 133 year history. The job that he's done can never be understated. He's the best manager in this club's history. Talk us through that initial journey then. Um, I think chairman at the time, Andrew Howard, called it his five-year plan from surviving on that day and the last day of talking in 2014 and all the way up to being successful League One club, and which you achieved as well. Um, talk us through that journey. That must have been a special time. Yeah, I think we set out a five-year journey that we nearly nearly killed after the first year because we nearly achieved the promotion that we set out for five years. But Andrew was, again, another really inspirational figure, Andrew. He is... Um, he is a man who who's, I respect so much. He commands respect. He's a real figurehead of the football club. He was chairman and, and really gave a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose, I think, is what I'm trying to say. He knew how he wanted to move the club forward. He, he was able to give you that story and that message of how he was going to move it forward and you bought into his plans because he, he mapped it all out and showed you the five-year plan and um, he really showed us the way forward. So he drove that from the top. With the gaffer, they, they, they moved the club forward um, and we achieved the promotion in maybe the third year of the five-year plan, I, I think, two years after Wembley. Um, so, again, maybe three years, uh, maybe I might be jumping a year ahead. I can't remember exactly how it was, but, yeah, um, a, real, a real good figurehead for the club and just someone that we needed at the time. We needed someone to come along and be really sort of authoritative in terms of knowing where he wanted to take the place and and everyone went behind him and, and he was a massive figure in this club's history and you can't forget the job he'd done as chairman um, throughout throughout his tenure. And as you mentioned there, you made it to Wembley in the first year of your five-year plan. Obviously, the result was not how you wanted it to go. Just talk us through um, that day and how you sort of processed it and how you sort of came back and bounced back from that uh, setback. That, I think, that experience... Um, certainly helped fire the hunger for the next five years or six years of my career since that moment because um, I I didn't want my legacy or I didn't want to finish at this football club and the main memories being just avoiding relegation to, from League Two to the conference and missing a penalty at Wembley and I knew that at that point that I had to find a way, we had to find a way of going achieving and leaving on good memories rather than, than it being that um, so, again, one of the things I've learned in, in, from life in football is resilience is built on experiences and sometimes your biggest blessings are, are actually, it takes a while to, to realise what they are, what they are. So getting released by Ipswich was one and missing a penalty and getting beat at Wembley in 2015 was, was another thing. It was the biggest um, blessing that could have ever happened to me because it, it showed me the resilience of how to bounce back um, you know, the social media abuse and the disappointment and everything off the back of that um, it's really taught me that there's only one thing that matters and that's that's your own feelings, um, your own thoughts about how you're doing things. As long as you're true to yourself with your own morals and values, then um, other people's opinions don't matter and you have to find a way of achieving. And, and luckily for me, I guess that I was able to banish those, those thoughts when we went back to Wembley the second time. Let's talk about that second Wembley appearance then. Um, that 2019 20 season was a real sort of Cinderella story from Wickham. You look around the dressing room of that promotion team, and largely the mainstay of that squad was the team that got promoted from League Two and the team that sort of solidified itself in League One the season before. What was the secret behind that dressing room that went from a team that survived in League One the season before and then achieved probably at the time the unthinkable of going to the Championship? Yeah, um, it was the unthinkable, I think, at the time. The year before, we finished 17th and, and our only ambition was to, to finish one place higher. Um, and the next year, you know, we started off well, got to the top of the league and it, it just kind of went from there. The, the only word I can use um, to, to sum up that squad was togetherness. We were a team that, um, it was almost like the stars aligned. You had, you know, the older lads, myself, Bayo, Darius, JJ, um, it was like we were just desperate to, to do something more with our careers in the twilight of our years. Um, and then you had some real good young energy, Gapey, Curtis, Anthony Stewart. Um, and then that summer, the gaffer went and signed some, some really good players. David Wheeler, Jack Grimmer, um, Namdi came in on loan, Rolando Aarons came, came in. On, and the stars aligned, mate. We were all at a point in our lives where we were um, willing to do whatever it took 
we had a, a, a willingness and a desperation about us to go and achieve. And we were, we just, we were a team that we were just together. We were a team and we enjoyed the wins together. We were together in the defeats. We took that on the chin together. Um, and we went out at Wembley. By the time we got back for the playoffs, at that point, I was, I was in no doubt that we had a, a huge opportunity to, to, to go and achieve something because the energy on that first day back at training, the focus and the energy uh, and the togetherness was just was in us. And um, yeah, luckily it went our way and we, we, we managed to, to win at Wembley, which was the most euphoric moment I've ever had on a football pitch. It's one of the most euphoric moments I've ever had in my life. Um, I was able to banish those memories of Wembley before the, the disappointments and um, uh, and the, I think the the heartache of not getting to the championship, not achieving what I maybe hoped to in my career, and finally doing it at the age of thirty six was um, yeah an emotional moment. And I think the scenes on the pitch afterwards um, sort of made that plainly clear. So you talk about the success of that season being the blend of youth and experience. Let's look at the youth side. Gav's got a real reputation of uh, bringing young players in, whether on loan or permanent, and then finding a home at Wickham Wanderers and going on to achieve great things in the game. Is there any p particular player throughout your time that's come through the door that you thought, wow, this kid's special? Oh, Ibire. Um, Ebbs was something else. I think the, th the thing was at that point in, in my career, we'd started playing with 4-3-3, Bale up top and then two holding midfielders, um, Gapy and Luke, and then myself would play slightly in front. And I wasn't attacking midfielder in the sense of doing all the skills and, and necessarily goal output, but I was able to make runs forward and take us up the pitch and link with Bayo, help him with his running and all the rest of it. And then we signed this lad on loan. Um, and little did I realise that he was just going to blow me away in the first tra training session and make me feel very inferior in terms of my footballing ability and the way I'd I could play the game and, and embarrass us all in training. And he was just incredible. From that very first training session, I was like, how have we got this lad on loan from QPR when he is this good? He's going to be a world beater, this lad. Um, and literally from the first training session, we knew we had someone special and we had to just enjoy him for as long as we could because he, he wouldn't be here very long. Um, and, and he took it out on the pitch. He, he used to win games for us single-handedly. We'd give him the ball and, and just wish him all the best. And, and off you go, Ebbs, go and win us the game. I remember, was it Crawley at home one day? Um, Cambridge away. He was incredible, Ebbs. But I have to say, what a lovely, lovely lad. What a humble, incredibly hardworking I just received a message on, on Instagram from him yesterday. Um, he, he called us literally the night we won at Wembley. He called us on our, he, he got Bayo to add him to the group chat so he could send us a message. Just what, what a great guy. And that's what I've, one of the things I've learned in this game is the top, the top players are also top people as well. And that's, and that's what I love seeing. Like, I'm so proud of what he's gone on to achieve um, and what he will continue to achieve. And, um, we, you know, as a club, we take great delight in, um, seeing the lads come on loan or develop here and you know if they go on and achieve great things then then we wish them well and, and watch on with, with with massive pride so yeah Ebbs was, was unbelievable One of the things I picked out when people were looking back on your career was your complete work ethic you'll never say giant attitude um, I think Bayo used to always say that you used to always be at the front when it came into pre-season always did that as you got older did you have to sort of adapt in order to stay fit and keep up with that work ethic that you were renowned for? Yeah, I almost, um, I think I almost enjoyed it more as I got older because as kids, maybe you see it as sacrifices, but as I got older, I realised it wasn't a sacrifice. It was just a vehicle to, to provide a life that I love doing. So I think that's what I enjoyed more as I got older is the fact that I, I used to look for ways to become fitter, look for ways to become leaner, look for ways to stay at the front because we used to have you know you had your gay peas your luco nines you had all these boys coming in with their young energy and enthusiasm and you know i, I used to think over oh, my dead body are you going to outrun me and outwork me and so it, it, it was it was incredible how those lads would come in and without realizing they would energize and inspire me to be better and fitter and stronger because i i got to that point where everyone was writing me off with my age and i was like no no no, no i can't i can't have this like i need to keep going and so you'd look for more ways me and, me, and, me and Luke always laugh about a story. We had a training match out on, on the training ground one day and we were on opposing teams. And our, our GPS that day was literally within 50 metres of each other because neither of us would give an inch. We were the most competitive trainers with each other because we couldn't let each other win. It just wasn't in our nature. 
Um, and I don't think I realised at the time that those boys really spurred me on. So I saw these boys coming in with the big futures in front of them. And I thought, I need to, I need to hang on to their coattails here. I need to be better. Um, so it's little things like that, that these people come into your life at the right time. Bayo comes into my life at the right time, inspires me um, to be better and to work harder and to, to help him in, in so many ways. And he helped me. So like I say, the stars aligned in the late years of my career. And I just, I just love that work ethic and to try and, try and elongate my career as long as I could. You've now moved on to the coaching side of things. How are you finding that? Loving it, mate. Yeah. I guess, you know, again, every cloud has a silver lining. The injury at, at, in August has given me a six month head start into this side of the, the career. So I've, I've literally been acting first team coach since then. And I'm actually absolutely loving it. Um, the chance to sort of serve an apprenticeship as you, as you, as you if you wish, um, under the gaffer and Dobbo, I could not wish for two better people to learn off. Plus, I guess the group of people we have here, the lads have been so, so good with me, um, taking my thoughts and on board and, and listening to me. Um, so I, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, it's just about, for me, it's been transferring that drive and desire, playing into, into my coaching and still trying to achieve the best I could possibly be. So, yeah, it's all good, mate. I've got so much to learn. Um, uh, it's, it's a whole new, whole new way of life and a whole new way of living, but I'm loving it so far. And, Hopefully, long can that long long can that continue? A big question for you now. What does the future hold for Mr. Matt Bloomfield? Good question. Um, I guess at this point, I don't I don't know entirely because uh, I'm just coming out of one career and trying to enter into another. Um, my contract's at an end at the end of the season, but I've spoken to the to the owners, Rob and Pete, who I, I must say have been incredibly supportive through this whole process, um, and they would like me to stay at the club. So hopefully, we'll sit down at some point and. And, uh, and sort that out because I, I certainly want to stay um, and continue this coaching journey. Um, I've been lucky enough in the last few days to, to do a few media um, bits and pieces as well. And hopefully that might lead to future opportunities. Um, so whilst one door closes, another one opens. And I'm, I'm so excited about what the future, future may hold. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit un insecure and a bit uncertain at the same time because I've done something I've loved for 21 and a half years or whatever it's been since I left school but I'm really excited about what the future may hold and I'm um, looking forward to, to grabbing it with both hands. And finally in your 18 years at the club you've seen the club evolve um, from the club in League 2 um, all the way to one that has real championship ambitions you must be really proud as you look back and think of the um, integral role that you've played in that. Yeah, I, th I think I'm, I'm really proud and really pleased to be at the football club at this point in time. It's never been stronger, both on and off the pitch. It's the best footballing squad we've ever had. It's the best um, staff we've ever had in turn. And the, the training ground's been upgraded. The grounds now uh, have been upgraded. The pitches, everything about Wick and Wanderers is, is the best it's ever been. Um, uh, so it's a, such an exciting um, and fantastic time to be involved in the club. And you know, that's part of my drive to want to stay. I want to see see where this place can get to because it's it's really exciting. Um, so, yeah, the, Rob and Pete have been incredible owners. The way they've dragged this club forward, like I say, Andrew Howard started it um, in 2014 or, or whatever year it was that he grabbed the club, took it forward, um, and Rob and Pete have come in and, and taken it on again. So uh, it's really exciting time to be involved in Wickham Wanderers Football Club. It's, it's, it's gone from strength to strength, and I'm really excited to see where we can take it in the future, and I'm, I'm hoping to be a big part of that. Well, Blooms, Mr. Wickham, congratulations on a fantastic career and all the best in retirement. Thanks, mate. Thanks for your time.